I'm Laura Miller. I'm one of the school psychologists in the Salt Lake City School District. And one of my roles is I sit on the private school's student services committee. And what that means is we have a group in the special ed department that has meetings and conversations and testing is necessary with all the private schools in our physical district. And so obviously Pingree is one of them. So we have a lot of families that come back to our district or maybe start in our district and go to you guys and then come back. And I think it's great that we're having this meeting to explain a few things and also kind of talk a little bit more about the process so it won't be so confusing and possibly overwhelming for families that do want to see, uh, explore some options in the district. And we do have families too that explore our options and we go over the evaluation and then they may choose to stay at Pingree and of course that's fine too. So I think one of the first things that's important to think about from a parent standpoint is the difference between the clinical medical model that happens at Pingree and then the districts look at view things through the educational lens. Some of the process is different, some of the outcomes might be different, and I think it can be very confusing for all families, obviously not just families at Pingree, with making that understanding the difference between the clinical medical piece and then the educational piece. One of the first things to talk about is some of the language that we use. So the clinical medical model uses a language like diagnosis. We in the educational field use the words classification. So we will not ever, you know, diagnose students. We have educational classifications that we use. And what that means is, for an example, for a difference, which is confusing also because it's a very similar language, is the clinical medical model uses the DSM-5 as their reference criteria listed in there, and it's going to be a clinical provider that will come up with that diagnosis specifically for autism. And I'll show you the differences. The majority of the families at Pingree will have that diagnosis, whether it's from Pingree itself or other providers before the child comes to Pingree. But that again is a diagnosis. And so here's an example of, there's the DSM-5 criteria. And I'm sure a lot of your families are familiar with it, but these are the things that they have to go through to meet the criteria for a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And it's changed from DSM-4 and and has evolved over the years. And so some of the terminology might be a little bit different. You know, I don't need to go over it. I just wanted to point out that there are some sort of some differences. There are some similarities. Communication and social interaction are big pieces for both the school setting and for the clinical medical setting. They use the DSM-5, which is very thick, by the way. It's a big old thing. And so there's lots of things in there. And as we know, a lot of children and adults don't fit into packages. So a lot of children may have multiple diagnoses. One of the most common ones is ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. But there are a lot of other things that might be comorbid with the autism. But anyway, so this is just an example of what the DSM-5 looks like. And there are multiple diagnoses all across the board in that particular book. And that's what the clinical medical people use. And then to contrast that, there's the special ed actual classification of autism. And yes, special ed is behind the times and they really need to change their classification terminology. But right now, and it's not just a Utah thing, this is the federal IDEA language for special ed. It's still called autism. And we're all waiting for it to actually get up at the times and and change it to autism spectrum disorder. But right now, the special ed classification is called autism. But one of the differences, I think, between the clinical medical piece and the educational piece is we have not only 13, depending on what state you live in, but pretty much 13 classifications for special ed as opposed to, you know, dozens and dozens for the DSM-5. But the special ed classifications can be specific learning disability, autism, health impairments. There's other things that, that could be. We are a state that does just one classification. Again, just like kids don't fit in neat little boxes for the DSM-5, they may not necessarily fit in a nice neat little box for special ed either. We are obliged to discover the primary classification. Some states have primary and secondary, to be honest, but we just have one. And so the idea is what does all the data lead to as the primary classification? And so this is the definition of autism according to the special ed rules. So the definition right off the top is a developmental disability significantly affecting verbal and nonverbal communication and social interaction. Really that first little piece before the comma is what we're looking for in the special education classification. 
classification of autism. The other piece is generally evident before three is not a mandatory piece, but I will tell you that part after that, adversely affecting a student's educational performance is what makes it also just a little bit different from medical model. In special ed, no matter what classification you're looking at, the child may meet the criteria for a, a specific classification, but there has to be evidence and data that supports it's adversely affecting the educational performance. And that's a phrase you'll hear a lot if you're ever in special ed. So it's kind of like, we call it three prongs. Do they meet the criteria for the classification? Is it adversely affecting the educational performance? And does it require specialized instruction or special services? So there's really three parts to special ed. As a side note, the child may have autism or autism spectrum disorder and not require special ed, there are other supports that may be necessary for the child, like a Section 504 accommodation plan or some other things. So um, that's just a second note. The must-haves, as we say it, is the nonverbal, the communication piece and the social interaction piece. As we know, some children with autism also have things like engagement in repetitive activities and stereotype movements, resistance to environmental change or change in daily routines, and unusual responses to sensory experiences. Some of these are really similar, it's just the language is a little bit different, to the DSM-5. But basically the point is the must-haves are the communication piece and the social interaction piece. The may-haves are those other issues. And we, obviously we know we've got kids with some and not others. And, and then number one just sort of talks about how it has to be the primary, if, if special ed team is looking at a couple different things, they need to decide that the autism classification is the primary classification we're looking at. So skipping to sort of letter B, you know, for any special ed evaluation, you know, we're always gonna have a team and the parents of course are an integral, critical part of the team. And here's the thing again about the three prongs, the uh, autism must adversely affect the educational performance. We'll talk about how we determine that and it must require some services. And then it, you know, there's all kinds of rule outs and other things like that. This is all out of our special education rules and regulations, which are also on the USBE website, just under special education rules. It was the state rules were just updated last fall, so or fairly recently and the parent procedural safeguards. I mean, there's a lot of things in place in the special ed world. And so parents have rights, students have rights, and you know, we always try to make sure we've, if we're going over those rights at every meeting and giving out copies and stuff. The p procedural safeguards of the parent rights have also been updated and they're also on the USBE website. It talks about the legal rights and, and things like that. So, so here's where it kind of goes into a little bit more detail of what do these things mean. So a significant impairment in social interaction. Here's some examples. It's not limited to, but here's some examples. Failure to use appropriate nonverbal behaviors such as eye contact, facial expression. The thing is, what is social interaction? It's part of the definition, but tell me what that looks like. So here's some examples. Failure to develop peer relationships appropriate to the developmental level, a lack of spontaneous initiation. You guys are all real familiar with these things. This is just the way it's worded in, special, in the world of special ed. And how do we get to these things? I'll talk about that in a minute, what measures we typically use and things like that. So significant impairment in communication. Again, you know, you guys are very familiar with all of these things. I say you guys, meaning the staff and the parents, but these are some examples, things like that. And as we know, when we're talking about communication in the world of autism, we're not just saying expressive and receptive language on a standard language-based test. A lot of it we're talking about is the social language and the social piece and the pragmatics piece and things like that. So there may be obviously delays in spoken language, significant delays for the other children that are higher up might be just more of the subtle kinds of social language and things like that. And then, you know, again, they've got some examples like little Roman numeral three talks about things like echolalia or, or quoting, you know, things from movies and, and things like that. Um, and then also just the social play falls under that communication piece. We're all familiar with some of the examples with restrictive repetitive behaviors and interests. That just gives some examples. Um, we all know children that may or may not have some of these characteristics. So, But it is pretty well spelled out. So this is kind of what the team goes by. That's the environmental change. So that's the transitions, you know, all those things that we know some children struggle with, you know, changing up the routine as far as the bedtime routine, putting the water on the toothbrush before the toothpaste as opposed to, you know, what might throw the whole thing off. The sensory things, we're all familiar with a lot of the different sensory issues. And so we get pretty good at asking families about that. I mean, that's not something we necessarily have a test for other than on checklists and things like that. But we, we talk to the families about those kinds of things. Um, and some are very obvious just from having the child in the room with us. But 
So those, those are some things that we take a look at in the special ed world. Okay, so here's the evaluation piece. The very next definition, alphabetically, in case anybody's curious about it, is deaf blindness. But the evaluation piece, okay, so, um, and I'll kind of go over that more in detail, but what I do want to, and I have my own little sticky note because I didn't want to forget that, but I wanted the families to understand um, under number two there for the evaluation piece. We do get some medical professional involved. And when I say medical professional, I mean qualified health professional. I should be a little more specific. Because that's part of the special education definition, it's sort of, if you can read through this, there has to be a record regarding any information, specific syndromes or health concerns or medications. And really, the best way to look at that is it's sort of a rule out. We need a medical professional to tell us there's no other primary, again, you know, there could be other conditions, but there are no other primary medical conditions or health conditions that would make us look at other places versus autism. I just say that because a lot of families don't understand, you know, why is the school nurse calling me or why do you need my latest well child check from my doctor? And it's really just, we want to be very comprehensive and we have to make sure that there aren't any other syndromes or health conditions or things that might lead us in a different direction than the actual classification of autism. Qualified health professional is very spelled out according to the Utah State Board of Education, and that is an RN, an APRN, a PA, doctor. They don't call a qualified health professional a psychologist or an LCSW. It really needs to be a, it could be a psychiatrist, obviously, but somebody with a medical background has to be part of our team. And that could be very simple. Like I said, it could either be the school nurse having a conversation with the parent and collecting data. It could be just any information from the pediatrician. So it's not a big piece, but I just kind of wanted to make the families aware that that is part of our evaluation. So here's the process in, in our district, and it, you know, it's for all private schools, but obviously we're talking to you guys. So the very first step would be to contact our private school special education liaison. It's not necessarily me. I'm part of the team, but Carolyn, now I say all this and Carolyn's actually retiring, but you can always find us. Somebody at the district office, the department will tell you who you need to talk to. But she is the person, she's the point person for all our private schools. And so they call, parents call, staff can call, whatever. It doesn't really even matter. And there's a process that, that our team gets together and then moves forward with the evaluation and um, things like that. So parents themselves, can call or people from the, the school can call and say, can you help this family or whatever. So that's the first point of contact. And if Carolyn's not available, she is part-time. Our secretary at the SPED department can give you information, but she's really good about email. Her phone is at work and she's out there every day, but email is, is great too. That's how the whole process starts. And this is great because this is these are things that Sarah and I have struggled with, like, who, where do we go? And do they, should they just go to their school and show up? And we certainly don't want families to have to go any more through any more process than they have to. So the best thing is to the families, you know, talk to the school staff or call us, your school staff, Pingree, or call directly to the district office and we'll kind of walk you through the process. Something I do need to say for parents to understand is you always have the right to literally just show up and enroll your child in your neighborhood elementary school. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that for your own sake and your child's sake. We want there to be the amount of supports your child requires. We want those to be in place. We want everybody to be ready. We don't want it to be a negative experience for you or your child. You have that right. You always have the right to go to your neighborhood school and say, this is my neighborhood school. I want to enroll my child. So that's just something to, to put out there. Contact Carolyn, say, I think we're interested in coming back to the district. You know, what do we do? And um, several of your families have done that. And I really appreciate it when the families contact us with a little bit of advance warning, <laughs> because it does take some time. I mean, I really wish the special ed process was faster or whatever, but there's a whole process involved in the special ed process. There's paperwork to be signed, you know, all these other things. And then just getting the team together to do the evaluation, have the meeting, all those kinds of things. And we've got, you know, school holidays and all those other things that kick in. So telling us in May that you want to come back in August is really hard for us. We do have some people that work over the summer, but they are schools. And so that's, that is a little bit trickier. So the families that can notify us earlier in the school year, it's, it's all the better. But sometimes that doesn't work out and that's okay too. We know life changes and things like that. Some families will contact us and say, we'd love to come back after winter break or something. We'll figure it all out, but the sooner the better to let us know. So Carolyn lets the team know that's me, the school psych. We have a, a speech language therapist that's on our team. We have an occupational therapist on our team. Carolyn herself sort of represents the special ed teacher because that's what she used to do in her previous life. And so we get together and then a member of the team, 
honestly, most of the time it's me, but a member of the team contacts the parent and just like by phone or whatever and says, tell me about your child. You know, here's our process. We have some openings. Let me get together with the team and find out some good times. And so that usually then involves coming to our district office. Now, again, I'm throwing all these things out at you, but we are moving out of our district office because we're going to have a new one built. I think most of our special ed staff is just moving to Benyon Elementary, which is not very far away from the district office. But anyway, the point being you, the parents, and both parents would be great, and the child come down to the district office Depending on the levels of the child and the needs of the child, we will do the assessment there. And we try to have the whole team there. In fact, we all kind of sit in, together, unless it's overwhelming for the child. But we can team different assessments and send the parents out. Or sometimes if the child really needs a parent in the room, we'll do that. Somebody might be working with the child. Somebody might be in the hallway talking to the parent. But we try to get it all done at one appointment so that there's not, you know, added stress with coming back multiple times and things. And then it's nice because we can all observe each other and the child in different kinds of settings and things like that. So the, the actual evaluation and what happens in that evaluation, of course, depends on the needs of the child and the levels, the skill levels of the child. But we will almost always be doing things like cognitive. When I list off all these different areas, they're literally just areas that we check on the consent to evaluate. What they look like in reality will look very different depending on the child. So if the child has the skill level to sit through formal testing, you know, pointing to the easel, answering questions and stuff like that, we'll certainly do that. Um, they may be able to do parts of a test and not all of the test, or if nothing else, then it's just um, observations that we do and checklists that we do with the parent and talking to the parent. Um, there's a, of course, I always joke that the parent has more work to do typically in these evaluations than the child because the child's hopefully just having fun. And we work obviously with all levels of kids and if they lose it, we stop. If they wander off, we follow them. So, and we have different sensory things and all kinds of stuff to hopefully entertain the child. We can take breaks because we're all about, I mean, this is not the SAT. We're all about trying to learn about the child and figure out what the child needs. So sometimes if we can't do a formal like cognitive test where like I'm asking questions and pointing to things and having them do puzzles and stuff, then we just do some informal stuff, see what they can do, see what they like to do. And then a lot of it is just checklists for the parents. And so there's a variety of different measures that are out there, standardized measures that are just like checklists to can your child point to two colors and you know I'll just ask yes no questions and stuff we do have to scores and I hate to use the word scores but we have to have data and numbers to be able to meet all the different parts of the classification and this is for all classifications however a whole bunch of it is informal and a whole bunch of it comes from checklists that the parents will fill out they will have done some checklists maybe with you guys but we want to get current stuff so typically we'll do like an adaptive checklist where the parent talks about their adaptive functioning in a variety of areas. We will typically update an autism checklist for the parent to, because an autism checklist is actually one of the requirements, required areas for the autism special ed classification. So we will do an ASRS or a GARS or whatever um, is appropriate for that child. So that's the gist of the evaluation, um, and it'll just be based on the child's skill level and what the parent is reporting. And again, most of the time, the kids have a good time because they just they get all this attention from all of us, and we try to do some fun stuff with them. Just as a heads up, part of all special ed classifications are vision and hearing results, and I know that's hard for some children because they don't sit still for those kinds of things, but that is because, again, in special ed, we have a lot of rule outs, and they're there for a reason, obviously. Like, we want to make sure the child has a past PASSED vision test or glasses or something so that we can say that the tests that we administered were done valid in a valid manner. If vision is off, then we're going to struggle with that. Same with hearing, and that's even harder. But if families can't access that or haven't been to the doctor in a while, a lot of times the vision gets done at the well child check. So a lot of those that parents can get their hands on, sometimes they can't get their hands on a hearing test, but we do have a district audiologist that will screen kids. And sometimes if they're comfortable with it, our speech and language coordinator can just put the little probes in their ears and test the hearing. It, sometimes the child may need to go to our full-on booth with the audiologist. And so we can get that taken care of just for families to realize ahead of time that that will speed the process along if there's any way they can get their hands on vision and hearing. So that is part of all of our special ed classifications. 
Then after we collect all the data, the checklists and all those different things, we score them and then we write a special ed evaluation. And that is all about putting in all the data and the observations and the history we've gotten from the parents and all those things. And we write it up and then there's actually two documents. One is just evaluation summary. And it's just all the scores, everything we know. It doesn't have a classification, doesn't have anything on it. But the idea is from looking at all that, you feed you to the classification. And for most of the families from Pringree, the classification will be autism. And the second document is where we plug in all the sort of legal requirements that, that show that the child meets the criteria as a student with autism. Sometimes, ideally, but it gets tricky when we haven't had experience with the child other than the evaluation, sometimes we can actually do an IEP at the evaluation eligibility meeting. And by that, again, people can ask me more questions later or call me, but an IEP is an individualized education program. And again, that's something unique to the schools. So when you hear IEP, that's a school thing. I forget what your treatment plan is called, but it's different, obviously. There's all, all kinds of vernacular that families will enter with bed. This would be the individualized plan to support the child with individual goals on it, services, those kinds of things. And it's a very fluid document. Like if we put a goal on there about naming five colors or something like that, then the child passes it off, we move on to something else. So IEP is very exactly individualized and tailor-made for that child. It's not an IEP for this class or whatever. It's an IEP for that child and it's got the goals on there and it'll have the speech and language goals if the child is eligible for that. It'll have the OT goals if the child is eligible for that. Don't don't have a whole lot of kids, I think, in your building that would need the physical therapist, but we do have a physical therapist who, need, if needs to be part of the team, can certainly do that too. But, but that's what the plan, the IEP will go over is the specific goals and the services. And then, ta-da, we get to the placement. So here's the thing. When we say placement, that sounds like, you know, we're putting the kids somewhere. Well, what we're really doing is, as a team, we're recommending, based on the level of need and the services and all these things, here's where we think the child would be because we, we want to make sure we're doing it in the least restrictive environment. You'll hear that a lot, LRE. And the idea is we want to put the child in the least restrictive environment to be successful. And kids move sometimes, like we, we get it wrong, or the kid makes a ton, a lot of gains, and so we, we change it up a little bit. But we doing, with our best guess and our experience and family input, we will determine where that child should go to school. So it could be anything from the neighborhood school with some special ed supports, maybe the Special ed teacher will help do some pull out for some areas or sometimes some of our special ed teachers go into the classroom and it could be speech and language services. So some kids may just be in their neighborhood school with some sort of pull out supports. And that could be an hour a day or half hour a day in reading and 20 minutes of math or whatever. And then there's levels, obviously. And so, you know, it could be to the point of two hours of resource a day. Like we kind of need a lot of support, but they can still be in the gen ed classroom. Those kinds of things. And it's very individualized and it's going to be based on that team which of course includes the parents. Now, some children will need an all day level of support. And we don't have those specific classrooms in every elementary school. They're in different parts of the district. So it would be based on address. But those, all of our schools, even the all day or what we call self-contained classrooms are in neighborhood elementary schools. So not, we don't have a special building or special school for any of our kids. All of our programs are in neighborhood schools. It just may not be your neighborhood school. The range of services is, is everything. And it's just going to be based on the individual need of the child and the, the team giving input. And parents are, uh, uh, I put that in there, parents can visit classrooms. We have some parents that might take a peek at two different classrooms, talk to the teachers and decide what's the best placement. So that is the process. I will say though, if it's not your neighborhood school and it has to be, you know, across the way or whatever, Transportation is provided. Transportation is always provided if the child is not attending your neighborhood school. Of course, if they're physically involved, even if it's your neighborhood school, they can get a bus to the school. But if it's a child that doesn't need wheelchair physical involvement that way, then the bus um, I don't want to speak to the too much because I'll get in trouble. I don't understand the transportation completely, but I think they almost basically do um, door to door. 
It's not like you have to go over to your neighborhood school and catch a bus there or whatever. They will come as close as they can, cross streets or whatever. If it's an apartment complex, sometimes it's hard for them to get in. So they might ask you to meet the child outside the entrance to the apartment complex. But anyway, the bottom line is transportation is provided if it's not your neighborhood school. One other point I wanted to make is a lot of your families probably have ABA therapy or something like that, or will be if they're leaving your building, they're, they're lined up to do ABA therapy. We do have children that participate in ABA therapy and go to school, but for sort of legal and privacy reasons and safety reasons and liability reasons, we don't have the ABA therapists come to the schools. And I think parents need to understand that because a lot of families are like, can they just come to the school and do it? And we can't allow that for like a whole bunch of reasons. So that's not a thing. Although we do have, especially with the little ones, like the kindergartners and things like that, where they might go to a half day, their ABA in the morning, and then they join the classroom in the afternoon or vice versa. So we do want to work with the families if they're currently involved in ABA therapy. We certainly don't want them to miss out on that. So we need, we can try to come up with a plan to work around that, but the families just need to know that we can't have any private therapists come into our school buildings for, like I said, a lot of privacy and legal reasons and things like that. So that is, are all my notes. <laughs> It's a lot to take in. All the families will be watching this later, but just contact me, contact Sarah knows how to get a hold of me, contact Carolyn, she can start the process, but we want to make it as smooth as possible. And I appreciate, you know, being asked to do this because we've had bumps in the past. That's not good for anybody. Then everybody gets frustrated. And we really want to obviously set up the children for success when they come back to our district. So we want to give them the supports they need from day one and start off on the right foot and not get frustrated because, um, that happens and we want to try to avoid that. So hopefully all things come through the special ed department. And if you can't find somebody to answer your question, just keep trying because we want to make this as smooth as possible for coming back to the district.